I want to begin by expressing appreciation to you, uh, to Annette, <coughs> to the Lantos Foundation, uh, for convening this, really, this very moving uh, meeting. It also allowed for the bringing of my family together. We don't always get together uh, in this way, but it's particularly poignant for me because my wife, who's here, has always been in the trenches <coughs> in this common cause, though not always on the same side, as I've always said in Canada, but a real fighter for human rights. But the greatest blessing for both of us is that our four children who are here are all involved in the case and cause of human rights. And I'm very, as I said, now I'm moved, humbled by this award. I have to say that uh, you've been able to manage secrecy uh, very compellingly. I knew nothing about these video testimonials, and what made them so compelling for me is those who delivered those testimonials, uh, where we are bonded not only in common cause, but in lifelong friendships and in the best of, of memories in, in that regard. So uh, I can't tell you how moved I was uh, by them. And to be able to receive an award that is in remembrance of and in tribute to Congressman Tom Lantos. Congressman Lantos was not only an inspirational role model for me, but he was an inspirational role model for all who knew him. Not only the first Holocaust survivor to serve in, in Congress, sometimes forgotten, he also fought in the anti Nazi resistance, saved, among many others, by Rao Wallenberg, who demonstrated, and we would talk about this, who demonstrated how one person with the compassion to care and the courage to act can confront evil, prevail, and transform history. A lifelong lesson for each and all of us in these very troubling times when Tom Lantos's voice and vision itself is so desperately missing and which we always have to recall and act upon. And I remember my first meeting with Tom Lantos shortly after he was elected to Congress in 1980. And we met and one of the first things we discussed was really the message, message transmitted by Holocaust survivors. As it happened, my first pro bono client in, in life was the Association of Survivors of Nazi Oppression in, in Canada. I began to work with them when I was a student. My son who was here would say I only had pro bono uh, clients. <laughs> but <laughs> th those who know my son will know that he has a humbling sense of humor for me. But when we got together, we recalled the message, the message of our common mentor, Nobel Peace Laureate and Holocaust survivor, Ali Wiesel, who spoke of the Holocaust as being a paradigm for radical evil, of anti-Semitism as being a paradigm of radical hate, and the lesson as he advised, to never forget that Tom Lantos acted on that so well that 1.2 million people were deported to the death camp Auschwitz, the most brutal extermination camp of the 20th century. 1.1 million of them were Jews. Let there be no mistake about it. Jews were murdered at Auschwitz because of anti-Semitism. But anti-Semitism, regrettably and tragically, did not die at Auschwitz. And it remains the bloodied canary 
in the mineshaft of global evil today. And as we've learned only too compellingly and too well, and I hate to have to repeat it, that while it begins with Jews, it doesn't end with Jews. That anti-Semitism, as my colleague and dear friend Ahmed Shahid put it in his landmark report to the United Nations in 2019 on anti-Semitism, as he put it, anti-Semitism is toxic to democracies. It's an assault on our common humanity. And it requires a constituency of conscience to combat it. It cannot be combated by Jews alone. And I say this in the shadow of the recent historical inflection moment, which I will get to shortly in my remarks. But in that first meeting with Tom Lantos, we discussed also Raoul Wallenberg. And he launched what then became honorary citizenship for Raoul Wallenberg in the United States. And he inspired me so that Raoul Wallenberg became Canada's first honorary citizen. Another joining together in common cause. But it did not end there. We worked together to combat and engage in the two great human rights struggles of the second half of the 20th century. The struggle for human rights, the struggle for Soviet jury, human rights of Soviet jury, and the struggle against apartheid. And to work with the two political prisoners who became the voice, the face, the identity of those two struggles. Anatoly Sharansky, as he was known then, Natan Sharansky, whom you saw in the video, where we have become enduring friends, our families joined at the hip, as they say, and Nelson Mandela, who became the voice and leader of the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa, who himself endured 27 years in a South African prison and emerged to not only preside over the dismantling of apartheid, but to become the president of the first ever democratic, free, egalitarian South Africa. But it took a long time. And I recall in 1981 when I was there with my wife, when just speaking about Mandela could put, land you in prison. And in fact, speaking of Mandela in 1981 did cause me to be arrested. And where I got a glimpse of the courage that Mandela exhibited for those 27 years in a South African prison. And we discussed not only these two struggles, but got involved in political prisoners. And through him, got involved not only in the great human rights struggles, but he also inspired me. It was his words that also inspired me to then become a member of parliament. We would discuss it. I always said that, you know, being a law professor, I thoroughly enjoyed being a law professor. But when I was asked, what's the difference between being a law professor and being a parliamentarian, I said a law professor is very important, the primacy of education and the like, but it is an ongoing seminar. As a parliamentarian, you're in the trenches for human rights. Those of you who are here know you're making decisions in real time that affect the lives of real people. And that's why I always felt the work of parliament was so important. I recall, if I may hear my parents of blessed memory, who were my first teachers about human rights. My father took me to in, visit parliament when I was 10 years old, and I still remember that. It's come back to me now, etched in my memory. When we came to the parliament building, he said, son, this is vox populi. This is the voice of the people. Today, people might look at that as being a, a mocking refrain, but it was from the depths of his soul that he said, this is the voice of the people. And then he took me next door 
to the Supreme Court and he said, son, this is the protector of the rule of law. And then he took me to the tomb of the missing soldier and he said, son, these are those who stand on guard for us here in Canada. And I mention this because we are the anniversary of a terrorist assault on the Canadian Parliament that took place when I was there nine years ago. And where uh, we remember the memory of <clears throat> those who fought off the terrorists at that time and just yesterday commemorated in Canada. So there are these you know, historical moments that are converging for me here as we meet. And then finally, there is the World Conference Against Racism in Durban that took place in 2001. I have to say, and I discussed this with Congressman Lantos at the time, that when it was first announced that there was gonna be a World Conference Against Racism in Durban in 2001, I greeted it with great interest, anticipation, and indeed excitement. This was going to be the first international human rights conference of the 21st century. This conference was gonna have its organizing theme, the combating of racism and hate, which is an assault on our common humanity. But regrettably, and I say this as someone who was at Durban, and where Congressman Lantos headed the American delegation at Durban, and expressed his moral courage in walking out of that conference, because a world conference against racism and hate turned into a conference, as he himself put it, and as I've shared it, a conference of racism and hate against the Jewish people. And I have to tell you, and that Durban conference is forever etched, not only in my memory, but in my being. I remember flying back to Canada on September 10th, and then awakening in the morning of September 11th to 9-11. And then with the horrors of 9-11 unleashing themselves, just as the horrors of the mass atrocity of Israel's multiple 9-11 have unleashed themselves. I remember one of my colleagues from South Africa calling me later that day, and I shared this with Tom Lantos, when she said to me that if 9-11 was the Kristallnacht of terror, then Durban was the Mein Kampf. That this is where the blueprint for hate that has metastasized over the last two decades has led us. And so I close with this historical inflection moment, which was not planned when the Lantos Foundation was convening this coming together. What I mean about a historical inflection moment is that we are meeting now in the shadow of the worst day in Jewish history since the Holocaust. Where October 7th, in American terms, was a multiple 9-11. I don't like to use that term because I don't want to reduce it to statistics. Behind every murdered person, behind every abducted hostage forcibly disappeared is a suffering and pained family, community, nation, state, international community joined together in common cause. And I was in Israel with my family on that October 7th. And so the memories of that day as they unfolded are forever etched in my memory. We were about to leave that Sabbath morning for the synagogue. It was to be a particularly festive Jewish Sabbath. It was taking place on the last day of the holiday of Sukkot, which in Jewish tradition is a particularly festive, joyous holiday, where we celebrate not only the forging of the indigeneity of Jewish peoplehood in the desert following the liberation from Egypt, 
but where we celebrate, that's a holiday in which we celebrate our common humanity. That's a holiday in which we are reminded of our mutual obligations to each other. That's a holiday which is both our Jewish thanksgiving and our obligations to our common humanity. But rather than go to the synagogue as the air rains sirens sounded, we were ushered into a bomb shelter as it foreshadowed the launching of 500 rockets targeting civilian population in the first hours of October 7th alone. Let us remember that under international law, and I don't like to deal with sometimes abstractions as a law professor, but in international law, the launching of one rocket targeting a civilian population is a war crime. The widespread and systematic targeting of civilians with hundreds of rockets are a crime against humanity. And let there be no mistake about it. After those first rockets, which was not the first time they were launched, were launched, they foreshadowed the worst of mass atrocities, of horrors too terrible to be believed, but not too terrible to... And they unfolded as we were sitting in the bomb shelter, watching it in real time because Hamas was uploading in a celebratory manner <clears throat> the very atrocities that they were committing, which is so horrific when these atrocities in our democracies and in the streets of our democracies are now themselves being celebrated and glorified by some. And so when we meet now, we know that we meet in the shadow of over 1,400 murdered, of over 5,000 wounded, and of some 220 hostages. These hostages are a looking glass into these mass atrocities. These hostages are a reminder and remembrance of the worst of violations of international human rights and humanitarian law and international criminal law. These hostages are a reminder that what we are engaged in here, regrettably, is not only a terrorist organization like Hamas, and I remind you, it's not only a prohibited terrorist organization under American law and Canadian law. It is a anti-Semitic, genocidal, terrorist government, not because I say so, but because they have said so in their founding charter in 1988 and have affirmed it ever since, calling not only for the destruction of Israel, but the killing of Jews wherever they may be as a religious obligation. They are not only an enemy of the Jewish people, they are an enemy of their own Palestinian people whom they have held hostage. So there are the hostages abducted and kidnapped in this war, and there are the hostages, the civilians in Gaza, whom they have used as human shields. A double war crime in that regard. A double ongoing, as we meet, standing crime against humanity. And so we are meeting today here in the presence of Noam, who's come here from Israel to represent the family of hostages. From her kibbutz alone, 73 have been abducted as hostages. The young and the elderly, toddlers and Holocaust survivors, the weak and the disabled. She has come here, as she said, not only because she is their voice, because she represents the family that have been abducted and disappeared, but because she has come here to ask us that we be 
their voice, that we understand the sense of urgency, that we do what Tom Lantos would have called upon us to do and his message is so present there, that we must be now the guardians, the guardians of our common humanity, that we must be the protectors of humanity, that we must come together as a constituency of conscience at a governmental level, at a congressional level, at a civil society level, in common cause, as I said, on behalf of our common humanity and with this sense of urgency, moral urgency that Tom Lantos represented in all his life and the least we can do is act upon that historical inspiration. Thank you.